Hey everyone, in this video we're going to go over section 3.11, hyperbolic functions. So, certain even and odd combinations of the exponential functions e to the x and e to the negative x occur so frequently in mathematics and its applications that they're given special names. Um, and in many ways, uh, in many ways these hyperbolic functions are analogous with the trigonometric functions in that the relationship that these hyperbolic functions hold with hyperbolas are similar to the relationships the trigonometric functions hold with circles. So, what we're going to be, like I said, we're talking about hyperbolic functions. They're sometimes called hyperbolic trigonometric functions. Oops, trigonometric functions. Or we get a hyperbolic sine, cosine. Um, so for, we'll start off with hyperbolic sine. The hyperbolic sine. Uh, this gets shortened to the sine h of x. So sine h of x is equal to e to the x minus e to the negative x, all divided by 2. Um, and cosine hyperbolic, which is abbreviated COSH of x, is equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x, all divided by 2. They differ in just this sign. And now the rest of our hyperbolic trigonometric functions are defined uh, in terms of sine and cosine just like the rest of our trigonometric functions are. So tangent hyperbolic, oops, not tan of h, tan h of x is going to be equal to the sine hyperbolic of x divided by the cosine hyperbolic of x. Oh, and we get the hyperbolic cosecant. is equal to 1 over the sine hyperbolic of x. The secant hyperbolic of x is equal to 1 over the cosine hyperbolic of x. And the cotangent hyperbolic of x is equal to 1 over the tangent hyperbolic of x. Or you could consider, or tangent, hyper, I'm sorry, or cotangent hyperbolic of x is also equal to cosine divided by sine of x. So, applications of the hyperbolic functions occur whenever an entity such as light, velocity, electricity, or radioactivity is gradually absorbed or extinguished. Um, the most famous application of the application I was told when I was in Calc 1 is that the, the shape of a telephone pole or an electric wire between two poles, its shape is modeled by the function um, y is equal to some constant plus a times the cosine hyperbolic of, of x divided by a. So this equation is used to model the, the sag of an electrical line but to, uh, between two poles. Um, and also, uh, a moving wave, the velocity of a wave, is actually given by the square root of gravity times the length of the wave divided by 2 pi, all times the tangent hyperbolic of 2 pi d divided by L, where d is the depth of the water and L is the length of the wave. So we have kind of a surface, we have a wave, and we have a depth to the ocean floor. And the velocity of the wave is given by this equation. L being the length of the wave, G is the force of gravity, so this is L, and this is D, and G is gravity. So these equations get used um, the two that you would almost have to memorize in a calculus class uh, would be these two. The rest of them, you guys should be you guys should be familiar with these ideas from a trigonometry class. Um, 
for better or for worse, you're not sitting down in class with me, so I don't have the expectation that you guys have these memorized. Um, I'm more concerned with you guys knowing about their existence. Um, I will also honestly tell you that the only time I experience a cosine hyperbolic function is when I teach this class or when I was taught this class. Um, it just never came up in the mathematics I did. Um, my wife's an engineer, she might have encountered these a little bit more. Um, but they do, they do get used in, in more application-based mathematics. They have some identities too, like I said. Um, these are going to be our hyperbolic identities. Oh, let me get the cat out of here. So our hyperbolic identities. So we have the sine hyperbolic of a negative x is just equal to the negative sine hyperbolic of an x. We have a cosine hyperbolic of a negative x, and that's equal to a cosine hyperbolic of plain old x. Oh, now this one, this is where it's going to deviate a little bit from the normal trigonometric functions. For the, for the hyperbolic functions, we have the cosine hyperbolic squared of an x minus a sine hyperbolic squared of an x is equal to 1. So this one, this is where we start to deviate some from our trigonometric functions. Um, now from this, from this identity, and I want to see what our, what we're tasked to do next, uh, is come up with that one. Perfect. So we can still manipulate this equation like we would a normal trigonometric function. So if we take this equation and we divide both sides by, say, a cosine a hyperbolic squared of an x, Well, cosine hyperbolic squared of x divided by cosine hyperbolic squared of x is equal to 1 minus sine hyperbolic squared of x divided by cosine hyperbolic squared of x is a tangent hyperbolic squared of an x is equal to 1 over a cosine hyperbolic squared of an x or a secant hyperbolic squared of an x. And yes. Uh, I've heard a lot of just, uh, I'm sure you guys are looking up resources online, getting help where you need. Um, I've heard these called cinch, coach, uh, I don't know, uh, seech, um, people kind of, they, they'll say the, this as a CHH sound when they're, when they're verbally communicating these ideas. Um, like I said, cinch, seech, um, I, I say sine hyperbolic, cosine hyperbolic. So we have we have identities. Let's see. Uh, we've got some sum to product identities too, like the sine hyperbolic of x plus y is equal to the sine hyperbolic of an x times a cosine hyperbolic of a y uh, plus a cosine hyperbolic of an x times a sine hyperbolic of a y. And we have one for cosine hyperbolic too. Cosine hyperbolic of x plus y um, is equal to cosine hyperbolic of an x times a cosine hyperbolic of a y uh, plus a sine hyperbolic of an x times a sine hyperbolic of a y. So we have some identities. Let's see what we want to do. Perfect. And so we've already, so in example one, example one, the first thing we were tasked to do is actually prove this identity. Um, so the other half of example one is let's go through and let's actually show this identity. We're going to prove that the cosine hyperbolic squared of x minus a sine hyperbolic squared of an x is equal to 1. And sometimes when when our 
when our identities aren't as straightforward as this one. We're, we're not just relying on basic definitions. Um, these identities uh, can be convenient if you return cosine and sine, cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic to these definitions. So what do I mean by that? So we get that the cosine hyperbolic squared of an x uh, minus a sine hyperbolic squared of an x by definition is equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x on 2 e to the x plus e to the negative x on 2 and then we're going to minus sine hyperbolic squared oh. squared this squared because of that squared and then we'll minus the sine hyperbolic, which is e to the x minus e to the negative x on 2, e to the x minus e to the negative x on 2, also squared, because of that squared. So we've done this substitution. Let's now distribute, or let's, let's multiply out our deal with these exponents is a good way of saying that. So going over here to give us more space that'll give us and I'm just gonna write I don't need you e to the x plus e to the negative x on 2 times e to the x plus e to the negative x on 2 minus e to the x minus e to the negative x on 2 times e to the x minus e to the negative x, all on 2. So, now we want to distribute. I can, uh, I will call this, that 2 times that 2, I'm going to pull out front and call that a 1 fourth times, we get e to the x times e to the x, that's an e to the 2x, e to the x times e to the negative x, that's going to be equal to 1, a plus 1, then we're going to get e to the negative x times e to the x, that's going to be plus another one. Then we're going to have e to the negative x times e to the negative x, which is e to the negative 2x. And we need a plus sign in between those. From that, we're going to subtract e to the x times e to the x is, uh, we need that 1 fourth out front, sorry, 1 fourth of e to the x times e to the x is e to the 2x. Uh, then we get e to the x times negative, uh, times negative e to the negative x. That's going to be minus 1. We'll get another minus 1. And then we're going to add e to the negative 2x. There we go. We're back. So now what we're going to do is let's... let's uh, I should have left the 1 fourth in. Let's distribute that 1 fourth back in so we can... And we'll combine some like terms real quick. So we get 1 fourth of e to the 2x. 1 plus 1 is 2 times 1 fourth gives us plus 1 half. Then we're going to add 1 fourth of e to the negative 2x. Then we're going to subtract 1 fourth of e to the 2x. We're going to subtract 1 fourth of 2, or we're going to add one half, or we're going to subtract one fourth of e to the negative two x. We'll gather out what's common. We've got a positive one fourth e to the negative two x and a negative one fourth e to the negative two x. Those will cancel. We got a positive one fourth e to the two x and a negative one fourth e to the two x. I've got a one half plus a one half, and all that, and I didn't need more paper, is going to equal one. So we have proven this identity by going back to those definitions. Um, we will return to these definitions a couple times. So next, let's, uh, let's just draw a picture of what, what's going on here. So in particular, uh, we're going to talk about... So let's say we'll do this. What are these hyperbolic trigonometric functions? Well, here's generic hyperbola. And 
somewhere over here we have the point cosine hyperbolic of t sine hyperbolic of t and now what t represents this shaded region right here is actually twice the value of t or you can think as t is one half of the area of this shaded region so before if we had say let's show we're talking about something else real quick before if we had a unit circle we'd have some point cosine of t sine of t where t was that measure in radians now we have this cosine hyperbolic of t sine hyperbolic of t and t is equal to one half of a where this region over here is a it has area of a so if we had an area of one over here the value of t would be two in here so that's the relationship that's how cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic uh, relate to a hyperbola uh, and showing you how similarly sine and cos cosine and sine I should say relate to a circle um, we can also take derivatives of hyperbolic functions um, I don't think you guys are surprised by that. So kind of our list, let's say the derivative with regards to x of the sine hyperbolic of an x is equal to a cosine hyperbolic of an x. And the derivative with regards to x of a cosine hyperbolic of x is equal to a sine hyperbolic of x. This one might catch you off guard. Um, and then we have the derivative with regards to x of the tangent hyperbolic of an x is equal to a secant uh, squared, secant hyperbolic, I'm sorry, squared of an x. Uh, three more, we've got the derivative with regards to x of a cosecant hyperbolic of an x is equal to a negative uh, cosecant hyperbolic of an x cotangent hyperbolic of an x we have a derivative with regards to x of a secant hyperbolic of x being equal to a negative uh, secant hyperbolic of an x times a tangent hyperbolic of an x and finally, our last one, we have the derivative with regards to x of a cotangent hyperbolic of x is equal to a negative uh, cosecant hyperbolic squared of an x. So the minus signs, where they occur, are different for the hyperbolic trigonometric functions. It's something to be aware of. So not everything from the trig functions translates perfectly to the hyperbolic functions. But everything for the hyperbolic functions really boils down to that definition in terms of E. So for example, uh, this is example two. For example, the derivative with regards to x of the uh, sine hyperbolic of x is equal to the derivative with regards to x of e to the x minus minus e to the negative x all divided by 2. So constants are uh, invisible or free to pass through derivatives so this is equal to one half of the derivative of e to the x is e to the x and then we're going to minus the derivative of e to the negative x is negative one e to the negative x which is equal to one half of e to the x plus e to the negative x which by definition 
is equal to the cosine hyperbolic of x. So proving identities, like I said, if they're not if they're not a straightforward manipulation of the identities themselves, if you're not trying to use these definitions, then convert back to these definitions. This is really these are these are kind of like elements and these are more like molecules. If you return it to the most basic form, some of these identities will be easier. Um, always look for a big picture approach. We could have proven this identity, for instance, by going back to uh, going back to the E definition. Um, but look for a big picture approach before you dive into, say, a little picture approach. But this, these, like I said, these are the elements. These are more foundational. These will work. Um, there, there may be easier paths. Um, so don't, don't get caught up in a white knuckle approach to calculus. Always take a step back and breathe and ask yourself if, hey, is there an easier way to approach this problem? Um, our derivatives, as always, can get a. Uh, I'm trying to leave those up so you guys can reference them. Um, our derivatives, as always, they even with the hyperbolic trigonometric functions, we, we're still going to use the product rule, the chain rule, the quotient rule, the power rule. Um, if we wanted a, then this will be example three. If we wanted to say take the derivative with regards to x of the cosine hyperbolic of a square root of x. This is just a composite function. You take the derivative of a composite function, use the chain rule. We have some f composed of g of x, where f of x is equal to the cosine hyperbolic of x and g of x is equal to one half, uh, is equal to x to the one half. When we calculate the derivative we're going to need an f prime of x. f prime of x is equal to the cosine goes back to sine sine hyperbolic of x and the derivative of g of x, g prime of x, is equal to one half of x to the negative one half. So when we calculate the derivative, we know we're going to get an f prime of g of x times a g prime of x, or we get the derivative with regards to x of the cosine hyperbolic of x is equal to f prime sine hyperbolic of, we're going to give it g of x, x to the one half times g prime of x times one half of x to the negative one half which you could totally leave your answer like this you could then go on to call this the sine hyperbolic of the square root of x all divided by two square roots of x if that made your heart happy you could go that far too um, I'm looking for this step but that is, that is a nice condensed form of the answer. So just like with normal trigonometric functions, um, the hyperbolic functions have inverses as well. By that I mean if we know that y is equal to the uh, sine hyperbolic inverse of x, that tells us that x is equal to the sine hyperbolic of y. And so by definition, let's work on this, if x, there's a hole behind there, I'll use that when I need it, if x is equal to the sine hyperbolic of y, that means x is also equal to e to the y minus e to the negative y all over 2. So if I multiply both sides by 2, these 2's will cancel. And that tells us that 2xe is equal to e to the y minus e to the negative x. Uh, e to the negative y, I'm sorry. To write that again. That tells us that 2x is equal to e to the y minus e to the negative y. 
And to get rid of this negative exponent, I'm going to go through and multiply both sides of this equation by e to the y. e to the y. What that gives us is a 2x e to the y is equal to e to the 2y minus 1. And now moving everything to the same side of the equation, we get, uh, we'll move everything to the right, we get 0 is equal to e to the 2y minus 2x e to the y minus 1. And now if you look carefully, this is actually a quadratic equation in terms of e to the y. So, for a regular quadratic equation, if we knew that 0 was equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, then by the quadratic equation, we knew that x was equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2 a. Well, over here, instead, over here, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. Over here, we were quadratic in terms of x, which is why we solve for x. Over here, we're quadratic in terms of e to the y. So we're actually going to solve for e to the y using the quadratic equation, which is going to be equal to, this is our b, negative b uh, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times our a is 1 and our c is negative 1 all over 2a which is going to be equal to, I'm going to jump down here negative times negative gives us a positive 2x plus or minus the square root of squared, I forgot that squared uh, that would give us a 4x squared. Negative 4 times 1 times negative 1 gives us a positive 4 all over 2 times 1 or 2. I can factor a 4 out of each of these terms. This will say this is equal to 2x plus or minus the square root of 4 times x squared plus 1 all over 2. And I can pull the square root of 4, or pull a 2 out of that square root, all divided by 2, which gives us x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1. Uh, let's see. I think right here, if you guys haven't been doing them all the time, it's easy to forget that the square root of a times b is equal to the square root of a times the square root of b. And so that's what I did here. I broke this up as the square root of 4. I broke that up as the square root of 4 times the square root of x squared plus 1. That square root of 4 jumps down to 2. And that's where we get the x squared plus 1. Um, in my calculus class, I tend to skip some smaller algebra steps just to get you guys used to the fact that professional journals um, in your later classes, they're going to skip over the little algebra too. Um, you guys also aren't sitting in a room with me to ask me questions on where did that come from. So that's where did that come from. So what we're down to is this. We know that e to the y is equal to x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1. And now the thing is e to the y has to be bigger than or equal to 0. e is a positive number, it's about 2.7, and whatever exponent you give 2.7, uh, the return will be something that is greater than 0. And x squared plus 1 square rooted is bigger than x, so we can't take the minus sign. So we know that e to the y has to be equal to x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Perfect. And consider, consider what happens when x is equal to 1 and if we had a minus sign. If we had a minus sign, that would say 1 minus the square root of 1 squared plus 1. 
Um, square root of 1 squared plus 1 is the square root of 2, which is about 1.4 for what we're doing. So if x was equal to 1 and we had a minus sign here, that would be 1 take away 1.4, which would give us a negative 0.4 about. So we know we can't, by that example alone, we can't take the minus sign. This has to be true for all values of x, and this equation is true for all values of x. It's true for some values of x with the minus sign, but all of them are true with the plus sign. But our goal isn't to figure out what e to the y is. Our goal is to figure out what y is. So we've got to take a natural log of both sides. Natural log of e to the y is equal to the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Natural log of e to the y is just equal to a y, which is equal to a natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. So this is our end goal. We were trying to get away from, and I've lost it because I started writing on a couple pieces of paper. Um, we were able to show that if y is equal to the sine uh, hyperbolic inverse of x, that also means that y is equal to the natural log of the quantity of x plus the square root of x squared. I'm sorry, I'm trying to track down my paper. Perfect. And it's true for any value of x. Similarly, and I'll give you all six of them now, these are the derivatives. Derivatives of inverse hyperbolic functions. Function. So we get the derivative, um, oh yeah, I'm sorry, I have jumped over, I looked at the wrong spot in my notes, we're not going to jump to the derivatives of them, um, we will do that next. What I wanted to give you is how we were able to say y was equal to the sine hyperbolic inverse of x and we got down to this formula. Um, we can also say that if y is equal to the cosine, and I got a put my hand here, cosine hyperbolic inverse of an x, well that's also equal to the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. And this has to have x being greater than or equal to 1. Uh, we get if y is equal to the tan hyperbolic inverse of an x, that it's also equal to one half of the natural log of one plus x over one minus x and just to have a complete list uh, with negative one less than x less than one we get if y is equal to the sine hyperbolic inverse of an x that is equal to the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared uh, plus one so these are kind of our closed form formulas. Um, without using without using these formulas, I actually have no idea how to calculate a sine hyperbolic inverse by hand. So for coming up with these numbers, um, or for coming up with the value of x that relates with the value of y, break it down to these formulas. On um, most calculate, I, I don't want to say most calculators. Um, many scientific calculators uh, are going to have cosine hyperbolic, tangent hyperbolic, sine hyperbolic functions. I don't know about the inverses. Um, those of you who use a TI-84, TI-89, TI-whatever, TI um, they probably have them in there. Uh, you'll probably have to hit like a functions button and then uh, you'll have to scroll through the menu. There's probably a hyperbolic functions or an inverse hyperbolic functions. Um, but TI-84 is 89, so they should have these buttons. If not, we've got these nice formulas. Um, so I would, like I said, I would encourage you guys to try and use these. I would also encourage you to figure out how you use your guys' as, uh, use your calculators. They are your tools. Uh, they're, they're what you're going to kind of be holding in your hand through college. So make sure you know where all the buttons are. 
We've shown that, we've shown that, we will, now we'll talk about derivatives of hyperbolic functions. Really, we developed these in order to say, uh, to talk about the derivatives of inverse hyperbolic functions. Okay, so we get, and I'll give, I'll write down all six, and then I'll prove, I'll prove one to you. Um, let's say that the derivative with regards to x of the sine hyperbolic inverse of x is equal to one over the square root of x squared plus one. Um, we get that the derivative with regards to x of the cosine hyperbolic inverse of an x is equal to, sorry, the cosine hyperbolic inverse of x, or the derivative of that, is equal to 1 over the square root of x squared minus 1. And the derivative with regards to x of the tangent hyperbolic inverse of an x is equal to 1 over 1 minus x squared. We've got three more. We'll say that the derivative with regards to x of the cosecant hyperbolic inverse of an x is equal to a negative 1 divided by the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared plus 1. The derivative with regards to x of the secant hyperbolic inverse of x is equal to a negative 1 over x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. And lastly, the derivative with regards to x of the cotangent hyperbolic inverse of an x is equal to 1 over 1 minus x squared. So, we developed this in order to get to here. So let me derive this derivative from this definition for you. So, by definition, the derivative with regards to x of the sine hyperbolic inverse of x is going to be equal to the derivative with regards to x of the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. So, I'm going to give myself some space. I'm going to work over here. This will be equal to, when we take the derivative of the natural log function, we get 1 divided by whatever the inside was, x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. And what we're going to do now, by the chain rule, is multiply this by the derivative of the inside. The derivative with regards to x of x plus, and for convenience sake, I'm going to rewrite this as x squared plus 1 to the 1 half equals. This is also equal to 1 over x plus the square root of x squared plus 1 times the derivative of x is 1 plus, by the chain rule, we'll get 1 half of x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 half times the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So now let's combine some terms over here. This is still equal to 1 over x plus the square root of x squared plus 1 times 1 plus, this 2 is going to cancel out with that 2, this x will be in a numerator, and it's all going to be divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. So now what we want to do is we want to combine these two terms. We want to put uh, 1 on a common denominator with this uh, term, and then we want to add their numerators. This will give us 1 over x plus the square root of x squared plus 1 times, and we're going to rewrite 1 as the square root of x squared plus 1 divided by the square root of x squared plus 1 plus x divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. Or, for the sake of argument, that is x plus the square root of x squared plus 1 times and you can add in any order you want to, so I'm going to call this x plus the square root of x squared plus 1 
all divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. And now if you look, we're multiplying these two, fact or these two fractions together. We've got a common factor top and bottom. They will cancel out. And what we're left with is 1 divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. So we would actually come up with the derivatives of the rest of these functions by going back to these definitions and just applying the chain rule where needed. Perfect, so the last thing we're going to do, example 6, is we're going to take the derivative with regards to x of the tangent hyperbolic inverse of the sine of x. So we've got a chain rule here, we've got a f composed of g of x, where f of x is equal to the tangent hyperbolic inverse of an x, and g of x is equal to the sine of x. So when we take the derivative of a composite function, that'll be equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So we'll need f prime of x, which is equal to 1 over 1 minus x squared, and we'll need a g prime of x, which is equal to a cosine of x. So the derivative with regards to x of the tangent hyperbolic inverse of the sine of x is equal to, we have f prime, 1 over 1 minus f prime of g of x, a sine of x squared, times a g prime of x, a cosine of an x. So one of the most important things you'll learn in a trig class is that the sine squared of an x plus the cosine squared of an x is equal to 1. And because of that, we know that by subtracting sine squared from both sides, that the cosine squared of an x is equal to a 1 minus a sine squared of an x. So at this step, we can actually rewrite it. We get the derivative with regards to x of the tangent hyperbolic inverse of the sine of x is equal to 1 over the cosine squared of an x times a cosine of an x this cosine will cancel out with one of those cosines, and 1 over cosine is a secant of an x. Perfect. So, really what I'm concerned with you guys being able to do is take derivatives of the hyperbolic trigonometric functions and their derivatives, maybe do some light identities or uh, proving some identities with them. But for the most part, these are, these are tools. These are differentiation techniques. I won't, I won't ask you for their derivations. I want you guys to be comfortable with using them, though. Um, for your homework, go off and do 31 through 45 odd. And send me an email if you guys have any questions. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.